Hi, I'm Matthew. And I'm Claire. Welcome, Welcome to, to Junction, Junction 1. One. Welcome, Welcome to Junction 1. We're glad you're here. Welcome to Junction 1. It's lovely you could join us. Welcome to Junction 1. Hi, I'm Steve. I'm Sharon. I'm Chloe. I'm Jessica. And, and we, we welcome, welcome you to Junction 1. Ooh, hi. hi. Welcome. Great to have you with us. Hi, I'm Matt. And I'm Chrissy, and welcome to Junction 1. Hello, my name is Tim. My name is Andrea. And, and welcome, welcome to, to Junction, Junction 1. 1. Hello, and welcome. 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 Welcome to, to Junction, Junction One! One. Woo. Hello and welcome to Junction One Online. Uh, and here we are, Rachel, in the barn tonight. Yes. <laughs> and we're hoping that this is going to be the venue for some of our real gathering in the very near future. But Church we'll, in the barn, we love it. <laughs> but we'll keep you posted. Yeah. Uh, we've also got tonight, as part of our programme, uh, we've got a testimony from Andrew Elliott. Andrew is a conservationist, passion, uh, passionate about the environment, and he's a scientist. So when you're a scientist, sometimes you have more questions, don't you? And Andrew's really had to work through the different questions to get to a place where he has faith and trust in God for the answers. So we're really looking forward to hearing his journey uh, from questions to faith. And also we're carrying on with our blessings for Bromsgrove area. Um, last week we heard from Richard and Brenda. Tonight we're going to hear from Michael. Uh, Michael and Andrea are living in Slovakia and uh, they're going to be praying for Bromsgrove. So we're looking forward to that too. We also have uh, Acts 9, the story of Saul being converted tonight. And I'm really looking forward to that because I love the story. I love the fact that Saul was somebody who was really antagonistic against the church and yet had an amazing conversion because God can save anybody. And that's what I take from that. God, no one is beyond God's hand. And I really feel as well that this might be a message for someone tonight particularly who is looking in who's thinking about can God save me can God be real for me and certainly that's exactly what happened to Paul so listen in tonight this might just be the message for you so before we go to have a song to worship together uh, Matthew and Claire are going to pray for us so it's over to Matthew and Claire before we pray I'd like to read some words from Psalm 62 first of all from verses 1 and 2 my soul finds rest in God alone my salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. And then from verse 8. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Let us pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, in these challenging times for the whole world, we give you thanks that we can turn to you for the comfort and assurance that whatever comes our way, we are safe in the knowledge that we have salvation in your Son, Jesus Christ. We are reminded of the song that you are the faithful one who is unchanging, and that we can depend on you as our rock of peace. Help us not to forget these truths as we continue to face the uncertainty of the COVID pandemic. We also earnestly pray that in these times, people the world over would turn to you, and these words of comfort would also become real to them. Help us to show them through the love and grace that you've shown us that the only way to reconciliation and peace is through your son, Jesus Christ. We ask for this in your name. Amen. Father, we thank you for everyone gathered here at Junction 1. We give thanks for Steve and Rachel that they have been willing to trust you with this vision for the people in the Bromsgrove area. Help us all to recognise the different gifts that we have and enable us through the power of your Holy Spirit to use them for your glory. Amen. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost But now I'm found Was blind But now I see 
Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear? The I first believe my chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And life. Junction One. Um, I'm Michael. Uh, my wife Andrea and I are living in Bratislava, Slovakia for a year. So Andrea will be returning to her job in the ambulance service uh, based out of the Bromsgrove hub, hub um, just opposite to the Harvester pub, um, just down from uh, Junction One. Um, uh, we, we're, we're both part of uh, Money Hall Church in, in Birmingham, uh, but in our time in Bratislava, um, We've been part of a small Baptist church of maybe uh, 50 members. Uh, yeah, uh, be, be assured of our prayers. Um, I'd uh, like to uh, take some time and uh, pray for you guys now. Um, Heavenly Father, thank you for um, this uh, new venture in, in Bromsgrove. Thank you for uh, Junction 1. Thank you for uh, placing this um, calling, this opportunity on on the hearts of, of the leaders of, of this church. Um, pray that it would be uh, faithful and useful in your service, Lord. Pray that um, this this church would um, be a shining light, uh, be a beacon of hope in, in the Bromsgrove area. Pray 
pray that it would be an opportunity to um, uh, to to reach out to those who don't know you uh, in this area. Um, pray that they would uh, be uh, place it, that you would be placing uh, people from this church alongside those who don't know you. That you'd be uh, equipping them and encouraging them to to share your gospel message and uh, drawing uh, people to yourself. Um, pray for um, pray for um, hope. Uh, pray for um, grace. Pray for uh, wisdom. Pray for your um, Holy Spirit's leading as. Um, as this church uh, so seeks to to work and to uh, be used for you, uh, pray pray that uh, those who are part of this 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 new undertaking would uh, would be encouraged and um, pray that um, it would be useful in your service through your Holy Spirit, Lord, um, and pray that um, through this church that um, many would be added to your number to your number daily, Lord. Uh, thank you for this uh, for this calling and uh, pray that it would be useful for your service, Lord. In your name, Lord. Amen. Um, yeah, thank you for um, the, uh, the opportunity to pray with you guys. And uh, like I say, be assured of our prayers and um, uh, looking forward to hearing how, how things are going. Um, take care. Bye. We're really, really pleased tonight to have Andrew Elliott with us. Um, Andrew's back home after, well, Andrew, you've had, you did your degree. You've yeah. been working in South Africa, mm -hmm. currently back home in, in Birmingham area again. Um, not too far from us, Bromsgrove area, I should say, really. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, tell us a little bit about what, who you are, what you've done for your degree. And I'm fascinated about what you're hoping to do next. Sure. Have um, a clue. <laughs> yeah. So I, yeah, I'm an ecologist. I uh, work in the local area. I did a biology degree at University of Birmingham. Um, I grew up in Birmingham as well. Uh, Matthew and Claire, some of you might know them, are my parents. Um, and yeah, I guess um, a pretty a pretty normal uh, Christian white middle class upbringing, really. Um, so you're a good drummer. I Thank you. Um, that's <laughs> I very always liked your drum playing. Yeah, yeah. I always thought that was particularly good. <laughs> always, always had a passion for music. Um, yeah. Played in church. Eclectic um, music range. Well, sometimes, all sorts, all sorts of music. Um, that's probably again yeah. dad's influence, but um, yeah, no. So kind of, you know, grew up in church. Yeah, you, you run mean? of the mill. Um, you know, young young Christian growing up in church, really, um, yeah. kind of trying to figure out how faith mixes with your lived existence as a young person. Yeah. Mm. So you did you? kind of over your teenage years and I remember chatting to you mm. when you were a teenager um I think you really grasped grappled with things there were lots of questions you had yeah things that didn't quite fit and make sense for you tell yeah. us a little bit about your journey through your thinking at that time um so I've always kind of been a the type to kick against the grain if you like I was never a fan or I was always told that I should question things um and actually throughout my growing up in church it was a lot of this faith talk and I was kind of like what is faith and I can see this in other people's lives and I can see it in the church in the people at church around me um but I'm not really feeling any of that myself um and it was very much uh I'll do these things and I'll do the things that might look like I have faith but actually in inside I'm not really sure that that's that is what I feel um and I think that probably was hampered um, or maybe caused by the fact that we are, you know, secondary education is a, is a battleground for forming your kind of worldview. Um, and actually in schools we're, we're taught that really, you know, science has the answers to all of that, that meaning, if you like. And actually that's a bit of a, it's, it's a bit nonsensical really to claim that science has any grounding in meaning whatsoever. Physics and chemistry don't really care for your emotions, perhaps. Um, and therefore it was a kind of like a two, a two strand way of approaching life. I had my church existence and I kind of knew what I should be doing. And then I had this kind of worldview being nurtured in, in school. Um, that was very much, you know, we don't really have time for, for faith. Let's focus on things that are perhaps, you know, more real that we can see. Um, and that combined with your, you know, your 
comfortable living, your comfortable materialism growing up in, in a, you know, stable family home. I never wanted for anything in particular. You know, I got out to do sports, music. I was encouraged to pursue all my passions. And I kind of realized that I didn't really have any desire to want anything more than that um, necessarily. And there was no need for a, a God in my life at that point in time. So, yeah. so how does one go from that sort of place where you go, actually, I don't really need God, mm. to what? How, how old are you now? 20, 23. 40, 23. Yeah. To a place now where you're absolutely passionate about God. You want others to know about him. Yeah. How does someone make that transition? Yeah. What was, what, how did you... How did that work for you? Okay, so I guess in my my university years, I was kind of, I was, again, experiencing my friends and uh, and other peers kind of enjoying the the fruits, I guess, of a relationship with Jesus. And this, this still just didn't, didn't fit with my perception of the world. And I was still overwhelmed by the fact that I can't, I can't box this. Can't, I can't necessarily make sense of it myself, and therefore I'm going to, you know, I guess pack it in. It's uh, it's it's one of those things that you either you can you can pursue it with your whole heart, or you can choose to ignore it. And that middle ground is a really uncomfortable place because you're almost living a double life, of where what's your what's going on the inside isn't reflective of what's going on the outside. And I basically had a a minor crisis and felt like you know what. This, I'm fed up of living this double life and it's not really for me anymore. But being the kind of the quite kind of logical, you know, what's the next step kind of person that I always have been, it was like, okay, if I'm going to renounce faith, what what's the other option? If God doesn't exist, what's the alternative? Um, and this is kind of what had been pushed on me. In, what what had been pushed on me in school is that actually God doesn't exist. Um, and I wish at the time I'd had kind of more scope to push back against that and question my peers and like, so actually what if God doesn't exist? Then tell me what, what, what are we, what are we basing our reality on? Do we have any, is there any meaning at all to the universe? Like, where do you ground your meaning if, uh, if there isn't a God? And I think some people like to go, uh, yeah, just, you know, we don't ground on anything, just live your life. Um, for the, the times you can have and live in the material world um, and like life is all we have and then when you die that's it and I I kind of I thought yeah that's interesting but do you live your life like that do the people I am hearing this from can they be consistent with that where do they where do they really place their value and if it's if it's on materials then what does that bring them does that bring them joy i would argue that actually no the only real form of joy i've ever actually probably experienced in in my life um in its purest form is watching people worship and having a relationship with jesus and it was very much like your joy looks like joy that you can buy and is short-lived and doesn't really maintain anything for you and actually you're faced with the ultimate kind of end that it's going to end and that doesn't seem like a really worthwhile thing living for. Um, so I guess it was like, okay, right, I'm going to spend some time actually seeing if that material world can satisfy me. Um, I'm gonna, you know, I've finished university now. Um, I've been successful in my degree and I'm going to go and kind of, you know, see where the world takes me and what it can offer me. And I went to South Africa. I did some research on some awesome topics that I was really passionate about. And I spent time with people who were living in a kind of, you know, more relaxed lifestyle about and not contemplating things about faith. And actually I could see that it just wasn't that good. It wasn't that great. There was nothing about it that was particularly attractive um, or sustaining in any way. Um, and so I kind of, having spent time away from home and everything that I knew, I kind of realized that actually um, relationships and people were important to me. And that was the kind of like, why is that? Why are relationships and, and people important to me? Um, and what do I do with that? Um, and so 
And did you feel that you um, were crying out for God? Did you were you um, yeah. looking for Him? So there are times there are times in my life. Did you feel that He came I, close to you? How did that yeah. come about? How did that experience yeah, yeah. of God become real for you? I guess there there are times in my life that I have like asked God for signs, and undoubtedly now in retrospect, I can look back and say, yeah, God was there in that moment, um, answering me. But in the in the process, I you know I convinced myself that it was you know mass hysteria or whatever. Or I was just, you know, just trying to convince myself that something had happened or God was sending me a sign, for example. Um, And so really, I think I began to realise that kind of viewing everything as nothing or everything has no meaning whatsoever, which is the ultimate reality faced by those who refuse to accept a kind of there is a God. Um, Then I I had to kind of choose that actually that's not going to work for me even more than actually living a double life is. Um, And again, going back to the joy that I'd seen, I was like, I want that. And that's what I want, really. That's the thing that means something to me and the relationships that I have and the joy that I get from relationship um, kind of drove me back towards pursuing something of God. Um, But I guess this time I knew that I had to approach it differently. I had to approach it first of all, completely willingly um, and out of my own kind of decision making. And then secondarily, actually it has to stand up against something that I can put my my intellectual um, kind of experience of the world in. And actually I think the one thing that I missed in school was that, you know, reasons for believing in God and for the case for Christianity in particular are huge. They're not small, um, you know, just wishy-washy fairy tales. There are, you know, top scientists who are top of their field and top philosophers and theologians who are so on the ball. And and like nothing I experienced was new. When I when I got down to researching and thinking about this, like I was finding that nothing I was thinking about was actually new at all. There was nothing <laughs> new under the sun when it came to, oh, why are we here? Um, and so it was a kind of a process of how do I make uh, a level playing field for me to again experience God's joy because before that I was being held back by my own experiences of of materialism and kind of you know not being willing to suggest that there was something more but actually on the basis of um, I guess theology and philosophy there is good reason to suggest that faith is reasonable in the first place um and i guess that's what kind of that, when you're in that position you can suddenly start to um you can trust i guess it makes trust considerably more you know it feels like you're not trusting you're not just trusting in something that you haven't got grounding in actually the grounding suddenly became very secure and in a position for me to develop um a trust and i think it was paul mallard maybe a couple of weeks ago who said faith is confidence based on evidence and actually that really struck struck me is that there is a huge amount of evidence to support the case for Christianity, not just there being a God, but Christianity as a whole. Um, and kind of from that, it was just, okay, so I've done all of this and I've, my, my kind of intellect has caught up with the fact that I want to pursue God more now. Um, what can I, what can I do? And it was a question of, right, the Bible tells me now exactly what I need to do. And I was, I was kind of reminded of me looking at people in church and not understanding why they were doing that. And suddenly it became like, that's why they're doing that. And actually this is the gateway to being in God's presence. It's just a, it's very simple. It's asking, asking to receive him genuinely with a heart that is perhaps new, is neutral and open to him in the first place. And I felt like my heart had never been there before. And not only was it freeing from the actually I used to sometimes think that my friends were right that there wasn't a god I was completely freed from that but also I was free to explore um kind of my background in terms of biology and science in a whole new way that kind of screamed how amazingly wonderful it was and not just an accident if someone's like you and they've really got these big questions very very quick two or three words what Um, what would you say to them to do and where would you suggest they went so I think for, for those who are perhaps in a position of not feeling God's 
perhaps God's presence, for example, and they're in church and they're looking at people and they're going, um, or you're a doubter and you're looking at those people going, I'm not really understanding this and how can I get there? There's a really good book by Barnabas Piper. It's called, I Believe, Help My Unbelief, which is a, a quote from the Bible. Um, and it really makes a case for how doubt is a part of faith. It's a natural part of faith. Um, and it's something to be worked through and not be not be suppressed. The Bible encourages us to, to question or given minds to use them. Um, and so, yeah, that's a great book. There's also, if you're a bit more... Um, enjoy logical philosophy uh, the logic of god by rabbi zacharias it's great um and then undeniable by douglas axe is also a great book um it's about tenor but it basically speaks to how the natural world around us um basically implies that there is there is a creator if you like um and beyond all that uh I can now say with confidence that if you sincerely with an open heart ask Jesus into your life, then he is already there. He's already knocking at the door waiting for you to accept him. So pray. It's a simple prayer. Um, so, yeah. Brilliant. Andrew, I could talk to you for hours and I have 10 million more questions I want to ask, actually, all the science stuff and how you respond <laughs> to nature as a, an ecologist and, and, you know, an environmentalist and all the rest of it. But thank you for being with us. Brilliant. No problem. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers. Okay, I have a Bible reading for us this evening, and uh, I'm just going to share with you from the Bible. It's actually from Acts chapter 9, and I'll just read there this, the account of uh, Saul meeting Jesus. So Acts chapter 9 and verse 1. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if they found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days, he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptised and taking food, he was strengthened. Amen. Excellent. Well, fantastic part of the Bible, uh, which we're going to look at together. Um, one of the things that I think we most enjoyed in Junction 1 since we started gathering has been the faith stories that people have shared with us. So it was brilliant tonight to hear Andrew's story. Uh, and it's actually been thrilling to see how God welcomes us when we call out to him. 
Uh, Charlie Maxey is an illustrator and an artist. Uh, and he actually designed the original question mark logo uh, that is behind the Alpha Course. So Charlie describes how he first encountered Jesus at a music festival. He was in a dirty and smelly toilet when he heard, oh, happy day, being broadcast over the festival loudspeakers. Charlie was an atheist, but he found himself, to use his own words, bawling and crying his eyes out. Now, Charlie's art, art has included many pieces uh, that have been inspired by the story of the return of the son in the, the, the uh, parable of the lost son in Luke's gospel. And that's where the father sees his younger son returning from far off and he runs out to welcome him. The father runs to give him a hug. And this is how God responds when we come to him for the very first time, or indeed any time we come to him. What a great thought. God rejoices along with all the angels when any one of us comes back to him. There are celebrations in heaven. I've sort of called our message tonight, unlikely converts. Uh, some people, uh, they have a sudden or a dramatic conversion, whereas others, they seem to have a very much more gradual and a quiet conversion to Christianity to become Christians. Everyone has their own story, but it always includes encountering and responding to Jesus. We read the Bible account of the conversion of Saul. This is probably the most famous conversion story that there's ever been told. And what a story it is. At one of the fellow sixes uh, a couple of weeks ago, several of us were remembering the book Run Baby Run by Nicky Cruz. It's a story of how Jesus met with a gang leader living wild in New York City. And he became a great evangelist. Well, He's now 81 and he's still telling his faith story. You know, there are some parallels between his story and the story of Saul's conversion. You see, Saul certainly appeared to be an unlikely convert. He wasn't an agnostic. Uh, he certainly did not seem to be open or thinking about Christianity. His mind was fixed and closed and it was hostile. He was perhaps the last person that anyone who knew him would ever have expected to become a Christian. Think of the leader of ISIS, and you're probably along the right lines. So verse one of chapter nine tells us that Saul was still breathing out threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. And he was on his way to Damascus to find anyone belonging to the way and then to arrest them. So what was it that they, this man, the most unlikely of people, become a Christian. It's really important. We might think that this all happened in a moment, that Saul encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus, and that was it. But I want to see a little bit behind the scenes. Okay, firstly, a little bit of background on Saul and what happened. Saul was a Pharisee. Uh, he was one of the religious leaders. In fact, he was, he called himself a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was a leader of the religious leaders. He studied under one of the most famous tutors of the Jewish law. That was a man called Gamaliel. And Saul was a brilliant student and he was passionate about keeping the law. We first meet him in Acts chapter 7 and the account of the, the martyrdom of Stephen. Saul is a young man, probably less than 20, and he's there at the stoning of Stephen. We read that the false witnesses, uh, they put their garments and their coats at the feet for him to look after while they executed Stephen. And then we're told that Saul approved of the execution, and it seems that he became a leader of the persecution of the believers. Well, there are some really significant points in this story. Firstly, Saul had been there at the trial of Stephen. Saul had listened to the testimony of Stephen as he gave his defence for his faith. He heard the final words of Stephen, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he'd heard Stephen's final prayer, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. 
I find it hard not to want to see justice done against all the people who are responsible for that terrible crime that they carried out. But note that Stephen, as he dies, he prays for his murderers. And amongst them is Saul. So secondly, the encounter with Jesus, where Jesus meets with Saul on the road. So Saul is on the way to Damascus. Remember, it's over 100 miles to Damascus from Jerusalem. And Saul has done a lot of preparations for this trip. He'd researched the situation and he'd recognised that Damascus was becoming an important centre for the gospel. And from that city, it was going to spread. So he had letters which he had taken from the priests. Uh, and he was taking with him a band of people. Uh, and he had his plans. But as he approaches the city, we have an account of what happened. Suddenly, a light flashes and Saul falls to the ground. A voice is heard. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus is speaking directly to Saul about what Saul has been doing to the church. He says, why are you persecuting me? Now, notice this is not sympathy uh, in the sense that uh, when you say that you're sorry about what's happened to somebody. Nor is Jesus talking about empathy when you say that you know how someone else feels when they've gone through something. What Jesus is saying to Saul is that you are persecuting me. You see, Jesus identifies himself with his church, with his people. Saul asks, who are you, Lord? Well, this is a great question. And actually, it is a question that everyone who encounters Jesus should be asking. And Jesus answered, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Jesus now sends Saul to Damascus and he gives him new instructions. He says, go to the city and there you will be told what to do. Do you remember in the Lord's Prayer, if you were listening to those uh, uh, messages which we had on the Lord's Prayer, do you remember the first three requests? Uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Saul is here being confronted with the need for him to change. You see, instead of hallowing the name of Jesus, he had been blaspheming. When he wrote to Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he says, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor and an insolent opponent. You see, he'd been a blasphemer, but he was also opposing the coming of the kingdom. And now he's being told to follow Jesus' instructions. Instead of following his own will, he's being told to follow the will that Jesus is setting out. So he's sent to Damascus and he sent, and for three days, he was without sight and he didn't eat and he didn't drink. Now, I, I cannot help but uh, make a quick comment on the reference to three days. There are some very well-known and famous accounts of three days in the Bible. And the phrase actually occurs 91 times. Do you remember Jonah? Jonah was three days in the belly of the great fish. Lazarus was three days in the grave before Jesus called him out. Jesus himself, three days in the grave. And now we have Saul three days without sight, without food and without water, almost as if he also is in a grave. And the significance of the three days is that it heralds a transformation and a new life. So thirdly, Saul actually becomes a Christian. And I love this part of the story. It involves Ananias. So Jesus appeared to Saul in a vision, but he also appeared uh, to Ananias in a vision. He calls them both by name. Unlike Saul, who says to Jesus, who are you? Ananias makes a great start in his response to Jesus. Ananias says, here I am, Lord. Then Jesus tells him to go to the street called Straight, to the house of Judas and to a man of Tarsus. So far, that sounds OK. But a man of Tarsus called Saul, for behold, he is praying and he has seen in a vision a man called Ananias come to him. Well, Ananias takes a step back. 
he might have been thinking, are there any other Ananiases who this might apply to? But it appears not. The message version of the Bible describes Ananias' response in this way. You cannot be serious. Don't you know that this is the Saul who's killing the saints and has come here to do the same? Well, the real encouragement for Ananias was in the words that Jesus had said when he told Ananias that Saul is praying. I think it's certain that Saul would have been saying prayers regularly pretty much all of his life regularly and frequently. But now, for the very first time, Saul is really praying. Jesus reassures Ananias that this is all part of his plan to bring the good news of the kingdom to the Jews, the non-Jews, and even to kings. So Ananias goes to the place that Jesus had told him to go, and he meets Saul. Brother Saul, says Ananias, Jesus has sent me to you. I wonder exactly how Ananias said the word brother. I don't know whether it was full of confidence, brother, or a hopeful plea, brother. Whatever, whatever we know, that Ananias, we do know that Ananias was faithful and that he followed Jesus' instructions. Saul receives his sight. And he's baptised. Saul, the great opponent and the persecutor of the church, has become, under God's hand, the great Apostle Paul, the great preacher of Jesus and the new life that's in him. Well, I said unlikely converts. And we can all see what made Saul an unlikely Christian convert. But this story tells us how even the most unlikely people can become Christians. Saul's conversion included the faithful testimony of Stephen speaking truth in great love. It included the prayer of Stephen asking God not to hold this person's sin to account and not calling out for vengeance. It included an ordinary and rather timid Ananias going and faithfully embracing and accepting Saul as a brother in the faith so that Saul joins the true family of God. If you're not yet a Christian, then I want to pray for you that you will respond like Saul. It's very likely that you've already been told something about how much Jesus loves you. Now, I'm sure that someone has been praying for you personally and now I, I pray, just like Saul, you will turn and become a follower of Jesus and that you will join his church. Remember the father in the parable of the, the lost son? God is longing to welcome you and to surround you in his love. God's arms are open, as it were, and stretched out, ready to receive you. I pray that you would see Jesus and that you would follow him and that you would have that great new life that everybody who comes to Jesus experiences and receives. Let me just pray for you. Lord, thank you for this great offer that you bring of new life through faith in Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, thank you that you love us and you died for us. And we pray that we would turn away from ourselves, away from every other way, and we would follow Jesus. And we'd know your Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And we'd know the fellowship and the comfort of being in your church, the church of Jesus. And we pray in his name. Amen.
thank you for being with us this evening, whether you have joined us at six o'clock or whether you're in your home at a different time of day and watching through the YouTube. Um, we just really want to encourage you, if you're a Christian and you've listened in tonight, uh, take really seriously the challenge that salvation is real and we can really with confidence pray for our friends and family, those around us, to be saved. Let's really get passionate about praying for salvation for our family and friends. And if you're not a Christian tonight and you're listening in, we would just really encourage you to think seriously about uh, the reality of the cross, about how Jesus can be your saviour. We'd really encourage you to, a bit like Andrew, to just keep asking those questions, to keep seeking for answers. Go to the Bible, go to Christian friends, you know, get in touch with us, but don't stop seeking for God because God has promised that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that is, that is absolutely true. If you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. God wants to save you. So, so if you're listening in tonight and you're not a Christian yet, don't delay. Do make that commitment and seek for him and he will find you. And so let's just pray now and uh, thank God for the evening together. Heavenly Father, we want to really pray that you would speak into each and every one of our hearts tonight. Father God, we want to be people who are passionate about you, passionate about praying for the lost. We want to see your salvation come in, in our area, in our neighbourhoods, in our workplaces, in our families. We want to see people saved to come into a relationship with Jesus, to know you, to walk with you, Lord God, each and every day. Father, we thank you that through the cross, through the blood that was shed, through the price that was paid, we can know forgiveness of our sins. We can know that promise of eternity with you. We can know a relationship that is so secure, so certain, and we can know a closeness that is closer even than the person next to us, that we can know you with us every step of every day. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit in dwelling in us, enabling us to live for you, turning our hearts to you, revealing Jesus at that point of salvation that we, we had our eyes open, just like Saul. Our eyes were opened. We could see you. And uh, Lord, we pray that for anybody listening in who doesn't know you, would you just open people's eyes and hearts to receive you? Even this night, even this day, whether it's in a bedroom, a living room, in a kitchen, Father God, you are everywhere and we just so thank you that you've been with us tonight and just pray that you would bless us in our week ahead. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. It's great, great you were able to join us. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us through info at junction1.org. Uh, it's always great to hear from people. But bless you. Indeed. And I was just going to say, do keep an eye on our website and social media, because if we do make that shift into the barn, we'd love you to uh, get in touch and see if you can come along and join and the church here. in the barn. Be here indeed. Great. Have a lovely week. See you soon. Bye. See you soon.